Good morning and welcome to worship. Here are the announcements for today. This Wednesday, June 24th, we will begin to relaunch some of our Wednesday evening activities here at the church, beginning with the Bible study at 6.30 p.m. Watch your email for more information. Starting next Sunday, June 28th, the start time of the early worship service will be moved from 9 o'clock to 8.30. Also on next Sunday, we will have a special called meeting immediately following the early worship service to vote on Keith Gilliam, our candidate for the position of Minister of Music. That meeting will begin at 9.45. On Saturday, June 27th, we'll have a meet and greet time for those who have not yet had the opportunity to meet Keith and visit with him. That will be from 12.30 to 1.30 in the church foyer. Those are today's announcements. God bless. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all our fathers out there in your nice Hawaiian shirts. Let's honor our Heavenly Father this morning. Let's lift our voices in praise to Him. Let's sing. Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but He brought me in all oh, His love for me. His love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Let's sing that again. I am chosen not forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me not against me I am who you say I am I am who you say I am who the Sun sets free who is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my Father's house There's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my Father's house There's a place for me I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. I am a child of God. My father is a king. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and he has promised that he would never forsake me and that he is faithful for all my days. Amen. I believe that this morning, and I want to praise him for that. Let's sing. Give thanks to the Lord our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched star. His love endures forever And for the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise, sing praise Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. 
praise forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever From the rising, from the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. praise forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever 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 God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us Forever, forever, forever. You guys go ahead and be seated. Good morning, and uh, happy Father's Day. Uh, scripture reading this morning are Psalms 3 and Psalm 4. Uh, Psalm 3. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, and I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Psalm 4, answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? But, the know, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when there are grain and new wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful privilege that you've granted us in Christ to call you Father, to be counted as your children. In Christ, we've been set apart for your purposes. In Christ, we're counted righteous. Because of Christ, you hear us when we call to you. We thank you, Lord, for that grace. We thank you, Lord, also for this time together to worship you as your children gathered. Pray that you would be well honored and pleased with what takes place this morning in this 
not just in this place, but Lord, in our hearts. As we seek to set our focus upon you and exalt you in our heart and soul and in our existence. Lord, may you be well honored. Cause your light, cause the light of your countenance to shine upon us. And help us, Lord, as we seek to live sanctified lives for your glory. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue to lift our voices to our Heavenly Father this morning. Would you stand? Let's sing about God's wonderful goodness. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercies never fail. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake Until I lay my head I will see Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkness, you were close like no other. As a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Sing that again. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Let the King of my heart be 
the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my son. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my son. You are could do for his child is to be in, show them the image of God and show them the love of God in everything that they do. And this song is my prayer as a father. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. I can't. 
King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's goals, O oh, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision. you that you are a heavenly father lord and that you've shown us the way lord you've laid a path out for us for us to follow not just as fathers but as believers lord and we thank you for who you are thank you lord that you love us thank you that your love is all that we need we praise you lord for this day we pray in jesus name amen you can be seated well good morning everyone happy father's day to the fathers here in the room Happy Father's Day to those watching at home as well. Uh, a quick service announcement for you. We will, as you heard in the announcements this morning, be starting back our Wednesday activities this coming Wednesday. And so to prepare for that, we do have a meal ready for you. It's going to be a very sanitary meal as far as we can tell. Uh, you know, our ladies always do a fantastic job, so we trust them with that. But we do need to kind of have a little bit of a count going in so we can prepare. So we're just going to do this very old-fashioned style. If you can just do a quick show of hands, if you plan to be here on Wednesday, even if you think you might be here, you're not sure yet, just go ahead and raise your hand so Pastor Mel can try to count that. <laughs> we all know how he does with numbers. It's a seminary thing. Thank you guys so much. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are going to be in Luke chapter 15 for our time. Luke chapter 15. You know, the scientific method was a system by which men and women have tried to understand the world really as far back as possibly the Greek philosopher Plato. You know, the procedure of the scientific method, to simply state it, don't get me later if you're a teacher and you know better, but the simple understanding of it is that you develop hypotheses on a certain subject. And then you test those hypotheses rigorously with the goal of eliminating all hypotheses until only one remains for you, thus you arrive at a conclusion. And so let me give you an example. If I wanted to find out how to create water, I would study the components of water. That's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. I would observe what processes are needed to combine those two elements into one molecule of water. And once I have figured that out, I can test that as many times as I want to, and it will always be true if I have the right hypotheses. That no matter what I do, as long as I keep to the recipe, I will always arrive at the same result. Now, I tell you that to tell you that everything I have ever read or observed has taught me one crystal clear truth. Raising children does not follow the scientific method at all. You know, you can look at any family you've ever seen, if they have multiple kids, you will see one commonality. They will be different children. They are just different little human beings. And, you know, for the most part, far parents will follow a very similar strategy when it comes to raising their kids. They might deviate some, sure. You don't drop the second kid on their head as much as you did the first kid. You try to avoid that. But for the most part, you try to have a very similar pattern, right? And yet what you find are children that are vastly different from one another. And so in today's text, we're going to see a father who raised and instructed two sons who, as far as we can tell, were raised identically, and yet they had two incredibly different paths to walk because of that. In Luke chapter 15, we get perhaps one of Jesus' most famous parables. Perhaps you know it by the title, The Parable of the Prodigal Son. And in this story, we typically spend the majority of our time in that, looking at that son who runs away from home, makes a wreck of his life, and then comes back to be graciously received by the Father. But really, my goal for us today is to see the story through the eyes of the Father. And is to sit and learn how he masterfully handles two polar opposite personalities. Now, this parable isn't told in a vacuum, just like any parable is not. Jesus told this parable in response to a complaint levied against him from the scribes and Pharisees. Look with me back into the very first verses of Luke chapter 15, and you'll see kind of the context for our story this morning. Here's what it says for us. 
Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him being Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribe grumble, saying, and I always imagine it in a really funny voice, saying, this man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Disgusting. That's what they say. They are so disgusted that a man who claims to be the Son of God would dare eat with such unrighteous people. And so that is the backdrop for us this morning for Jesus telling us this parable. And so now join me in verse 11, where we're going to spend the majority of our time in the actual story itself. The parable begins in verse 11 of chapter 15 by Jesus saying, there was a man who had two sons. Now, we don't know any more background information from Jesus about how this man raised his sons. We don't know if he ever spanked them or didn't spank what camp he fell in in that. We don't know if he ever put them in timeouts. We don't know how long he waited to let his kids start dating. We don't know those things. Apparently, it's not important to the story. But what we can kind of assume from the story is this man is a Jewish man. It's not too far-fetched to assume that. And we do know a little bit about how Jewish men were designed and told to raise their children in the faith. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, particularly in verse 7, but I'm going to read verses 4 through 9 for you this morning, we get clear instruction for men of how they should raise their children. Let me read for you from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Did you hear that? Basically, everything you do, teach them the law. And so this was the precept for parenting in the Jewish culture that you instill in your children the law of God. Everything you do should be about that purpose of teaching that law to the next generation. That's the goal for the parent. And we do that today. We teach the law to our children today. We teach them the Bible, read the stories to them when they're younger, as they grow. We teach them the precepts of the Lord and how to walk in those things that they will lead to life. We even teach them civic laws, like the laws of traffic, right? Because we don't want them to be a danger to society, or even worse, raise our insurance premiums, right? Now, it's perfectly reasonable to conclude in the story that Jesus tells this morning that this father did this for his sons. He's a good Jewish man. He probably most likely taught this very well for his sons. And yet, when you read the story, you see the sons behave so differently that you would have to assume something went very drastically different in their developments. And so we see the first son in verse 12 of chapter 15. He approaches his father and said, And the younger of of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And we don't know the age of the son when he asks us. We know he is the younger of the two brothers, but we don't know his age. Now, we know historically speaking, for lifespans and things of that nature, that at the most, this young man would have probably had to wait till about 30 years old until he received his inheritance. That's just kind of the way life expectancy went in that time. So he didn't have a very long wait, so to speak. But this young man was so bothered by that that he couldn't wait anymore. This young man figured it had just been too long of a wait. Perhaps this son was like all teenagers throughout history who felt that living under the oppressive subjugation of his parents was just too much, right? That the constant demanding reminders of such trivial things as clean your room or take out the trash was just throwing off his vibe too much or killing his groove. And so an incredibly presumptuous move, the son approaches his father, demanding his inheritance be given to him. Now he can wait no longer. And so to paraphrase his son, this is basically what he says to his father. I would rather you be gone, and I have what is coming to me, than to continue on this relationship. I'd rather you be dead to me. Now, This is an incredibly presumptuous move. I mean, honestly, imagine for yourself if you're that father this morning. How would you feel if your son or daughter came to you with that kind of a demand? Hey, I'd rather you be dead. Just give me the money I'm going to get from you now, and we'll just call this thing done. Could you imagine? Could you imagine, oh, okay, you want me to be dead to you, right? Oh, and you want a large sum of money right now? That's, That's the command you're coming to me with right now. 
That's just got to make you feel all warm and fuzzy on Father's Day, right? This father wasn't leaving behind a small inheritance. We'll see later in the story that he is significantly well off. And yet at this point, the first shocking move on the father's part occurs. Look in verse 12. Doesn't he divided his property between them? He gives them the inheritance. This incredibly arrogant, presumptuous move is met with a blessing from the father. That he divides the property. Now look back into that text there and notice that he divides his property between them. He even gives the son who's not asking for the inheritance his inheritance now. It's incredibly generous. Even the son who's not being a presumptuous little twit gets his inheritance. And what follows in this story through verses 13 through 16 is really the story we all know about the prodigal son. The son leaves his home with his newly demanded property and proceeds to, as the Bible calls it, squander it away. Now, I love that word squander there in the text. It's just a fun word in English, but in the Greek is the word diaskorpizo, which is also a fun word to say. And it carries in mind this picture for us of a farmer throwing out seed onto the ground, right? As a farmer goes and walks his field as he's tilling it, he throws the seed out there with hopes of harvest coming, right? It's just a scattering of things. And so if you can just imagine with me this morning, this son walking around this new country he's in, just throwing money around, right? He wants money over here, here's some money over there, here's some money over there. I'm just giving away money right now because that's how I roll. That's what he's doing. He is living his best life now, or so he thinks. Because you know how the story goes. Once everything is gone and there's no emergency fund left, as Dave Ramsey would recommend for him, a famine comes. And the economy of the land that he lived in comes to a crippling halt. It's so bad that this young Jewish man had to go feed pigs. And looking at your text there, he actually envied what the pigs got to eat. It says that he, in verse 16, that he longed to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. No one gave him anything. Now, I don't know if that really kind of lands on you how big of a deal that is this morning, but for a Jewish man, this is the lowest of low points you could ever go, possibly, in your life. That his life got so bad, he had to work for a Gentile man, one that probably, honestly, he thought he was better than because of his faith and his background and his culture. He's working for a Gentile now. And not just working for a Gentile doing any kind of labor, he's working for a Gentile feeding pigs, the most unclean animal to a Jewish person's mind. This is emphatically low. This is beyond shameful for this young man. It's at this point where I can't help but think that perhaps this morning you feel very much like the parent of this young man. That it's possible that in this room or watching online that there are people that you've raised your kids as best you can. And they grew up and they broke your heart and they're breaking your heart today. It's very possible that you see their pictures on social media and you see how utterly foolish their decisions are. That you've tried so hard to raise them better and yet this is what's happened. And it breaks our hearts. It breaks my heart just thinking for our parents that have to go through that. And then we see the turnaround begin this text. It's as if the light bulb goes off. I love in verse 17 where it says, but when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? It's it's like the light bulb goes off above his head. He has that one amazing idea to start turning things around, so he begins to craft this plan for how he's going to go back. He says this, he says, I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he crafts this plan and says, look, I'm going to go back to my father. I know he is a compassionate man. Now I'm going to go back to him. Obviously not as a son. I forfeited that right, but I'll go back as a hired hand. Surely he'll take me back in. He's a good man. And so he starts with his crafted plan and heads back for home. It's not ideal, but it's so much better than where he is right now. And then we see the father's response and what follows. And what follows really is this young man coming to ask for forgiveness, and we just see a lavish, compassionate grace extended on this son. Look with me in verse 20 of the text this morning. 
It says, And he arose and came to his father. By the way, he was still a long way off. His father saw him, and I love this phrase, and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, the, the first thing I want you to note in that text is who saw who on that day, right? It's the father who sees the son first. What does that imply for us this morning? It implies that that father was always looking to that horizon for his son's return. That he never gave up hope. For all we know, that father had to go out there every single day looking at that horizon, hoping and wishing that his son would come home to him. We hear the stories all the time of moms who stay up late into the night waiting for their teenage sons to come home and not make foolish decisions. It's, it's almost like you can imagine that in this story. That father just looking out, hoping and praying that that son's going to walk down that road again one day. It's crazy to me because the man whom the son wished was dead is the one who kept hope alive every single day that his son would return from his foolish path. Now, the father had to have known this was going to happen, right? The father knew this was a foolish plan. It's just so obvious to me that he did, that his son had devised a foolish plan that would end in shamefulness. The same way I'm sure many of you dads have heard some of the most foolish plans come from your sons and daughters, right? That they come in with this great idea, and you're like, this is going to go wrong for a thousand reasons. But you also know at times that children just need to kind of learn things the hard way. And sometimes you have to let them go and make that mistake in order that they can learn for themselves. That's what the father did here, I think, in so many ways. He allowed his son, against his better wisdom, to go with hope that one day that light bulb would click in his son's head and he would come back home. The father waited each day for his son to come to his senses, and today was that day for the father. And when he saw him, it said in the text that he ran to him. Now, this part may not land on us as it would the first century Jewish crowd, but let me just let you know, in that culture, men didn't run for anything. That the Jewish men had a very dignified way of walking. They would walk at a certain pace to show their maturity, their dignity, to run around with shameful. Little kids run around. Grown men don't run. And so, for this man to take off running for his father, or running for his son, rather, was shameful for that father. The father, probably in the middle of the day, for the whole town to see, takes off running towards his son. Now, mind you, the son who had already humiliated him once, embarrassed him in front of his peers, and he runs to that son, and he embraces him in his arm. And the son I love, he tries to get out his rehearsed speech in the text and tries to ask for the job, but the father doesn't allow it. Look back into your text there. In verse 21, it said, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father's just like, shush. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a, finger, a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. He doesn't even let him get the words out. And do you know what he's doing in that text? Do you know why he's putting a robe on his son? Do you know why he's putting a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet? He is doing that because he is restoring the son's identity. The son had run off and run so hard into the ground that he forgot who he was to the father. And the father would have nothing less than a son come back home with him. He wasn't out there every day looking for a servant to bring into his house. No, he was looking for a son to come home with him. And so he restores him with all these acts. Listen to the father's words in verse 24. I love this. It says, For, my, for this my son was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost and is found. This is not an ordinary reunion this morning. This was a resurrection of sorts. This son was dead by all accounts, dead of his own volition, mind you. But now that he has returned, it's the equivalent of Lazarus walking out of that tomb in John 11 when Jesus calls his name and walks out. This is a resurrection happened. Someone's come back from the dead this morning. 
love that. Because we all do that, right? We all run off to all these things, and if we're honest, they kill us. And we, when we're away from the Father, walk around like dead men. But in that moment when we come back to him, it is a moment of resurrection and not just simple reunion. And so this, at this point, is a fantastic story. And as amazing enough as it is, the story continues with Jesus going on in verse 25. Because not everyone in this story is excited about the younger brother's return. The older brother reappears on the scene. And what's so fascinating is that, look, we know the younger son has caused heartache and shame for his father. We just assume kind of that the older son's the good guy in the story, right? Like, surely that one's a train wreck, so obviously the other one's got to be the good one. That's usually how it works. There's a bad one and a good one. You wouldn't say that about your kids, but I've talked to some of y'all, and I see it in your eyes. There's good ones, and there's bad ones. And so we just kind of assume that he's the good guy. But when we start in verse 26, we see that that older son has just as many hurdles to overcome as the younger son did. It says in verse 25 and 26, it says, Now this older son was in the field, most likely working, and he came and drew near to the house and heard music and dancing, which you think would be a great sign. But it says in verse 26 that he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And so he comes to the edge of the house and he pauses. Something's not right for him. It's throwing him off. And so he calls the servant over. And the servant, in verse 27, gives him the play-by-play. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because we have received him back safe and sound. He gives them the kind of play-by-play, right? Just the details, right? Your, son, your brother, you know, the one that was dead, he's come back to us. Your father is super excited. He's having a barbecue inside there right now in a party. Come on inside. It's a great time going on. And then verse 28 is probably one of the most peculiar verses in all of this text. It's probably, if you imagine hearing this story for the first time, it's almost where the record scratches. You think, surely this can't be right. But read with me in verse 28. It says, but he was angry and refused to go in. It's strange. It's, it's so strange that if you keep reading in verse 28, it says that the, the father had to go out and entreat him, his son. He had to go out and entreat him. Now, really, honestly, a better word for that verse is probably the word begged. He had to go out there and beg his son to come into a barbecue. Now, look, y'all, we live in central Texas. We know good and well that you don't have to beg any of us to come to a barbecue. So something is clearly going wrong with this man this morning. And again, can you just imagine if you're the father, that this son of yours who has run off and done all these terrible things has finally come home. This is the most wonderful day you could possibly imagine. And so you throw this lavish party, and then all of a sudden the older son, who's been the good kid, who's done all the right things, He is outside throwing a temper tantrum about a party. And it's at this point that we see the deeper conflict of this story begin to emerge. The younger son was a train wreck, and everyone saw that, didn't need explanation. We all can kind of see that clearly in the text. We all knew he was broken, but in this moment we see the older son, who never caused problems, who probably did all of his Torah homework on time, who worked hard for his father. That son was just as broken on the inside as his brother. And the older son lashes out in this text. It says in verse 29, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your commands, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice that, In verse 30, when this son of yours came, you who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? If I could just paraphrase for you this morning, it's like he's saying, I've never done anything wrong. In fact, I've done everything right for you, and you've never once given me a single thing. You won't even give me a goat, right? But now, this son of yours comes home after devouring your property on prostitutes 
and you kill the best calf we have, it's almost as if he's saying, that should be my party in there. I'm the one who deserves that. And the father compassionately responds once more. Look in verse 31. And he, the father, said to him, Son, which is a great word, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother, notice that, this your brother, was dead and is alive, he was lost, and he's found. The father compassionately responds, and I want you to really notice there how he responds to his son's complaint. It's actually a very similar response. There's a lot of parallels in the response between the younger son and the older son because it all boils down to the word identity. That the younger son comes from a broken mess and the father must remind him of his identity. And the older son comes home full of self-righteous anger and the father must remind him of his identity. But not just his identity in relationship to the father. You are my son. But that's also your brother. And so remember, you are my son, and this is your brother. We are family. And when family wins, we all win. And today we've won. You know, when I, what I love is that the text, as Jesus tells the story, is left in a tension point for us this morning. We don't know how the brother responds. It's kind of left up to us. That's kind of the point of parables many times is that it's not so much the story's response, it's our response. And when I think about this story, there's many things that kind of stick out to me. One of the most amazing things is the example of love and compassion radiating from the Father. And if I could just sum up this parable for you in one sentence this morning, I would be this. Good fathers love their children enough to change them both on the surface and at the heart. Let me say it for you one more time, because it's worth hearing. Good fathers love their children enough to change them from both the surface and the heart. We see in the story two sons, one who has all the signs of terrible behavior on the outside, right, the younger son, who has been terribly insulting to his father, who's made deplorable decisions with all of his ideas in his life, and that's a problem, right? We should care about how our children act and seek to encourage good behavior in them. That's a good biblical thing for us to do. But in the older son, we see a much more deceptive evil lurking beneath the surface. In the heart of the older son, we see a heart that seeks to justify itself, a heart that thinks it's good and really, really believes in its heart how good it is. A heart that has led to a pretty arrogant response this morning. And here's a truth for you, fathers. If we only care about the behavioral modification as a parent, we can easily find ourselves looking into the eyes of children who are just like the older brother. Because to just deal with the surface issues of life is to constantly avoid the deeper heart issues of our children. We know the younger brother was a tw had a twisted heart, but we can often miss the twisted heart of the older brother because he hides it well under a thin veneer of good behavior. And this father would have none of it in this parable. And so he fixes it, and he does it with identity. Remember, he tells the younger son, who has forfeited the right to be called a son, that he will extend grace and allow him to be a part of the family again. But for the older son, the father crushes his pride by reminding him that there is nothing he has done that has made him his father's son. The young man didn't force his way into that family before conception. It's not scientifically possible, if you're wondering. It's a gift to be born into that family. And it's a privilege, and he has to remind him of the equal footing he has with the brother whom he despises. Yeah, you're one. This older brother, as good on the outside as he was, has missed the thing the younger brother has learned, that real change happens at a heart level. And you know how we know in the story that heart change is happening? We see it by proximity to the Father. That a broken, twisted heart will always avoid the Father. 
and a heart that is full of grace and full of mercy and humility will always seek to be near him. Remember in the story, the younger son, right? Twisted heart in the beginning. What does he do? Takes all of his money and gets as far away from the father as possible. And yet in that moment of coming to his senses, what is the thing he does? Goes back to the father. And that older brother, who again looks so great and stayed so close to the father and did all the right things, right? At his moment of revealing his heart, what does he do? Doesn't go near the father. Because again, it's the broken, twisted heart that avoids the father, but it's the heart that has been broken with grace and humility that draws near to the father. As Tim Keller once said, there are two ways to avoid Jesus. By being very, very bad, or by being very, very good. You know, we can easily spot the very, very bad kids, but it's much harder to spot the very, very good ones. Now hear me, I'm not saying that we should totally neglect teaching good behavior to our kids. I am definitely encouraging in that, teach good behavior in your children. It's good for them to have good marriages. It's good for them to be productive. It's good for them to get good grades. But listen to me. If we are more focused and if our parenting goals are more in line with getting our children into Harvard than heaven, we have missed the point. We can't just settle to try to fix the behaviors that bother us. We have to aim to fix the heart if we ever hope to see real change take place. And dads, that's going to require you to be uncomfortable. In our culture today, for whatever reason, we have this trope that men don't talk about feelings, that men don't talk about heart issues. Christian fathers, let me look at you in the eyes right now. For you to not care about the heart issues of your children is not care about your children at all. Got to care. Now lastly, this story is not just an example of good parenting. It's an example of God parenting. In this story, we are one of two people today. Either we are the younger brother or we are the older brother. And perhaps you're bad and you know you're bad. Especially you, Bill Lane. But perhaps your life is characterized by a lifestyle of throwing it all away into the wind. That lifestyle is going to end in heartache for you one day. That lifestyle will constantly take more from you than you ever thought it will, and it will never give you the things it promised you. It's going to crush you one day. There is a better life to be lived, but it's not a life you imagined as being good. It's the life that God has for you. It's the life of a son or daughter of God. You know, we had that identity all the way back in Genesis. Genesis 1 and 2, we were closer than close to God. And we threw it all away like grain into the wind. And the rest of the story of the Bible and the rest of the story of history is God looking out on that horizon waiting for you to return to him that one day so that he can wrap his arms around you and he can celebrate you being resurrected back into the family. You know, the crazy thing, he's already running after you. He's already ran as hard as he possibly could after you. We call that the cross. You want to talk about ultimate shame and humiliation? Look no further than the cross. But as graphic as that was, it's just as beautiful as the father running towards his son. I love that we sang the song, Goodness to God, this morning, because his goodness is running after me. And it's running after you. If you would just simply turn around and receive it. But maybe that doesn't characterize you. Maybe just maybe you've followed all the rules of your life. You've gotten the good grades. You stayed out of trouble. But if we're being honest, you just don't feel like you've gotten what you deserve in life. You feel like life has done a great disservice to your excellence because it hasn't recognized it enough, right? And everything I just described right there is called one word, pride. the same type of pride that characterized the scribes and the Pharisees who prompted this story in the very beginning, remember? You know, Jesus later in his ministry would look at those men and diagnose them with lethal precision. In Matthew 23, 27, 
Here's what it says. Woe to you, which is never a good way to start a conversation. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. I don't know if you caught that, but nothing about that was a compliment. And for you today, if you are realizing this, that nothing you have done in this life has made you worthy or more deserving of the life that God has given you. The Apostle Paul would say it this way in Galatians, in Galatians 2.16. says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will ever be justified. Are you constantly trying to build yourself up? Is your goal when you get to heaven to look at God and say, you know why I'm here? Because you've done so many great things? I have a feeling the next sentence from God is going to start with, woe to you, if that's what you believe. You know, that hamster wheel of trying to be good enough that you have been writing maybe for your entire life, it's not going to get you anywhere. The only place it's really going to get you is hell one day. Come see a better way, a way through faith in Christ for what he has already done for you. You know, it's funny, we call this story the prodigal son, but do you really know what prodigal means? That's not a word we use all the time in our language. I haven't used it all this week, so I have to tell a story, what I'm going to talk about. But really simply, it means having or giving something on a lavish scale. Wastefully extravagant is kind of a phrase you could use for it. Now, certainly the son in this story fits wasteful extravagance. But do you know who truly was the prodigal one in this story? It's the father. That father lavishly extended grace and compassion to that son who was so undeserving of it. He heaped on the blessings to him in a way that is so hard to even fathom. Now, as great as the father is in this story, he's just a a pale, pale reflection of the God we talk about this morning, whose lavish grace looked like this, that he sent his son on your behalf. He didn't even send a fattened calf. He sent the son. He sent the jewel of all of eternity in your place. That is a prodigal. And so this morning, we're going to pray now as the band comes back up. I'm going to invite you to a time of prayer. I'm just going to be quiet for a few moments here. And here's what I want you to do. If you're a father in this room, my prayer for you all week is that I make you uncomfortable today. Because when we're uncomfortable, we can step into moments of faith and see God move in our lives. And so I'm praying for you all week that you would be bothered by this sermon because I hope they would compel you to a greater love for your children. Do you know the first understanding of God your children are going to have? It's by what you do. That you're that first massive authority figure in their life and how you relate to them is going to reflect how they're going to relate to God. So how are you doing? That's a big burden. It's not easy being a dad. But it is a beautiful challenge. And so let's pray now. With our heads bound, our eyes closed. And again, I'm just going to give you some time to seek the Lord in your own heart because maybe you are one of these brothers this morning. And maybe you've realized today that I've either been a train wreck or I've been a hardened heart hidden behind veneer. And today something's got to change for you. Because whichever one of those paths you're on, if it doesn't turn around, it's leading towards hell. And so what are you going to do? You can talk to me after we get done. You can talk to Pastor Mel. You can talk to Keith if you want to. Pretty smart guy. You just talk to somebody this morning. Let me pray for us now. Father God,
of all the things I love to call you, Father is number one. And Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your lavishness in the way that you have loved us. And I thank you for the ability to hear stories like the prodigal son. Because it reminds us that you're so much better than we even dream. And so Lord, for those in this room that are fathers who are thinking back on their years of being fathers and maybe even kind of taking inventory right now. Lord, I pray that you would speak truth into them, but you would do it as you always do. You would speak it truth and love. That you would say, yeah, maybe you've fallen down here, but here's the truth. You can get back up and be better today. God, for those of us in this room that are dealing with who we are in that story. And again, we only get two options. Lord, let the truth of our life be that we draw near to you. So Lord, we love you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that. You know, you're always kind of skeptical when, when somebody who's not a father starts telling you about being a father. But uh, I got to say, brother, you nailed it. And uh, as, uh, as me being a father, you really spoke to my heart, and I really appreciate that this morning. I thought he did a great job this morning. Uh, hey, before we, before we leave, we're going to sing a, a, a song here, a chorus of a song. Uh, but if you'll notice back here on the, uh, in the choir loft, there's, there's some chairs, there's some uh, music, and there's some hymnals up there. And so that's advertising because um, we're, we want to do a choir next week. So we, I'd like to have a choir. I'd like to have some folks up here singing in the choir. So uh, come at 11 o'clock next Saturday if you want to be part of it, and we'll sing a song. I, I promise you, you're going to know the song that we're going to sing. We're going to work on it. We're going to have a good time, and then we're going to sing in next Sunday service. So 11 o'clock next Saturday. So if you want to sing, be here, okay? So, Kristen, go ahead and start that off. Let's stand this morning. We're going to be dismissed, and we're going to sing just a little bit of this song as before we leave. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise with a mighty hand. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. And for the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. You guys have a good week. Thanks for coming this morning.